everybody, Sandre here, and welcome to the sixth IQ video in this series. As I'm recording this, there's construction going on outside of my window, and if some of the sounds of the fucking heavy machinery makes it into the video, I do apologize. I'm gonna try my best to clean up the audio as much as possible, but this needs to be recorded now, and I can't wait until later. Anyway, I think the content of this video will more than likely make up for any noise that might make it in. Also, before we begin, I would just like to thank all the people who support me on Patreon. I have three patrons now, and I just can't believe it. I mean, $27 per video? Now, that being said, if, if you want to donate to me on Patreon, just, just keep in mind, I only charge max two times per month. The reason I have it per video instead of per month is because then I actually have to make a video to get paid. I, I can't cheat, in other words. And like I said, I only charge max two times per month. Again, thank you all who support me, and also thank you all who have subscribed to me recently and have been subscribed to me for a long time. It really means a lot that I get support by you guys to make these videos. I have a pretty tight schedule and I'm a very busy person, but I do my best to make these videos happen. And the fact that you enjoy them and want to support them, it really means a lot to me. It really does. Are different performances on standardized tests a sign of difference in intelligence? Are differences in intelligence then rooted in genetic factors? If genetics is determinant of one's intelligence, would this be why there's a difference in IQ between so-called races? And most importantly, are these racial differences in IQ an undeniable biological fact and immune to social or technological efforts of changing them? None of these questions are new, mind you. Charles Murray and Richard J. Herrnstein tried answering these questions in the bell curve, which led to confrontations in politics and in academia over topics such as institutional and societal racism, freedom of academics, and limits of meritocracy, the ethics of research, the validity of the IQ test, and social policy. The bell curve has been and is still being pushed as some kind of major revolutionary work, a book with undisputed data and statistics that can be, and only be, explained by inherent racial differences. Thing is though, it's honestly a pathetic book with no real relevance to the questions it actually purported to answer at all. That's not just some opinion of mine, mind you, it's just an observable fact. I doubt many of the people pushing it in heated arguments online have actually bothered to read even a single page of it, let alone a chapter. It is a book with a veneer of credibility, and it does contain plenty of citations for genuine statistical facts between so-called races. However, it's not the smoking gun it was and is still hyped to be. Reason being, it is, and only is, a glorified collection of sociological papers. Its ideas and proclamations are merely rehashed constructs from psychologists, psychometricians, and anthropologists originating in the 19th century. Constructs such as the general factor of intelligence from Charles Spearman, to Louis Tierman's invention of the standard Binet IQ test and hereditary interpretations of its results, to a hierarchical taxonomy of races by Carlton Kuhn. Nothing and only nothing purported by the bell curve is anything new or even from the modern era of scientific research. Not even any of the sources of data are from biological fields. It's all just sociology, and the only citation from the biological fields are from before modern scientific models existed in those biological fields. Hence, the book literally cannot be argued to be based on any sound biological basis. However, I will talk about the bell curve in my next video. Today, I will focus on the supposedly revolutionary findings of Rushton and Jensen, two names being dragged up often by genetic determinists of all varieties. In order to cite their works to back up their claims of racial differences, they have to make the assumption that 1. IQ is at least a fairly correct measure of intelligence, 2. that there is a general intelligence factor, g, 3. That standardized tests can correctly measure it. However, some objective phenomena convolutes these assumptions, such as 1. Contradictory studies, and 2. Intragroup changes in IQ scores over the last hundred years, and their sheer magnitude. 
but more on that later. One of the most cited papers by genetic determinists is a 13-year-old paper by Arthur Jensen and J. Philip Rushton. In the paper, they classify human beings as, I quote, Negroids, Caucasoids, and Mongoloids. No, really, they actually do that. Yes, a paper only somewhat older than a decade claims human variation can be classified into no more than three human races. To return a bit to the bell curve, Jensen especially has been debunked for over five decades now, both by his peers and by findings in other fields. Yet the bell curve without shame cites him. Jonathan Mark's book Human Biodiversity, Genes, Race and History takes a massive swing to the integrity of Rushton. Let me read a few lines. J. Philip Rushton calculated on the basis of crude skull measurements of army inductees that the average brain size of Asian males was 1403, of whites 1361, and of blacks 1346 cubic centimeters. Have we thus discovered the biological basis for the differences in intelligence that previous generations have always assumed were there? The scientific issues and assumptions are as false as they have always been. First, we must admire the apparent cranial expansion of Asians over the last half century when researchers consistently reported their having smaller brains than whites. Obviously, this implies the possibility of a comparable expansion in blacks. More likely, it implies the possibility of scientists finding just what they expect when the social and political stakes are high. Douglas Wallstein, a neuroscientist, in his review of Rushton's Race, Evolution and Behavior in the Canadian Journal of Sociology Online, wrote, I believe that great harm could be done to both the social and natural sciences if the standards for evidence and proof advocated in this book were to gain wider acceptance. They have failed to show an opposite predicted ordering in brain size, intelligence and sexual restraint. Oh. I forgot to mention, Rushton was so shameless in his clearly biased work that he made companion studies of average penis size by race. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> oh man. Yes, Rushton was obsessed not only with black people's IQ and craniums, but also black people's penises and lack of supposed sexual restraint. Anyway. Rushton may be responsible for papers more suited for comedic purposes rather than scientific ones, but his research is relevant to this video because a common claim by genetic determinists of all varieties is that there is at least a 40% correlation of brain size with IQ. And a paper claiming this, and that this in turn explains 5 IQ points of difference between blacks and whites, is usually cited. Let me quote Marx that I mentioned before. Basic scientific protocol requires that all relevant variables be controlled for before drawing conclusions about the cause of an observed difference between samples. But in this case, we do not even know what those variables are and what the appropriate statistical corrections, for example, for body size may be. Brain size correlates, for example, with age and with nutritional state in early life. Though there was agreement that women have smaller average brains than men, assuming their brains don't grow in subsequent studies, they apparently do not have lower average IQs. This obviously would undermine the strict determination of intelligence by brain size, which should already be common sense. By now, this approach to the determination of the average intellectual abilities of group members has degenerated into sophistry. The populations within each race vary widely in measured cranial capacity, with the four largest sets of skulls deriving from the aboriginal males of Hawaii, Tierra del Fuego, France, and South Africa, respectively. Just to clarify. 1. There is no reason to claim that a difference in brain sizes are not due to non-genetic variables, such as diets, for instance. Two. As an example, men and women have almost identical average IQ, while women have smaller brains, meaning that brain size in of itself is futile to explain any major difference. The fact that body size to brain size proportions also factor in makes this an even more convoluted factor. Even many animals have a larger brain size to body size ratio than humans, and yet the very same genetic determinists would be hard pressed to not say that we are objectively more intelligent. 
Differences in brain size by observation has no bearing whatsoever from any tests by the same methods proposed by these genetic determinists. My personal favorite is a study of children who were born in post-war Germany, where it turned out that children of African-American GIs had the same average IQ as children of Caucasian GIs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is fucking gold right here. Now, when I bring up this study, sometimes a common attempt at a counter by these people is that military recruits are already pre-screened for intelligence. Here's the issue, though. Most of the brain size data these people use are based on tests and measurements on soldiers. Ergo, that black and white soldiers' children have identical average IQs shows that brain size can't be determined genetically or that brain size can't and will never explain any IQ gap. To put the icing on this shit cake, the IQ gap between so-called races is narrower than ever and is still shrinking all the more. To quote a summary by Brad DeLong, The average IQ score of America's white population today is 100. According to Ulrich Neiser, America's white children in 1932 had an average today's test IQ score of 80. Dutch army conscripts in 1952 scored 30 IQ points lower than conscripts in 1982. The African-American IQ test average rose by 6 points relative to the white average between 1972 and 2002. According to Brierley, in 1970, and in the 1960s African Americans from Ohio, had an average IQ score greater than that of whites from Arkansas by 10 points. And with that, I leave the topic of Rushton and Jensen. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like and a comment, and also please subscribe. Please also share my stuff online, it really helps out the channel, and please also follow me on social media. You will find the links in the description below. Again, thank you all. Bye!